Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome to any visitors as well. On behalf of the Church Council, we have the following announcements. Uh, attestation received from the Reformed Church van der Park Trinitas is Brother Pietrus Foster. Um, there are two brothers who went for medical procedures during this week. Uh, they are Roy Aslet and Jakub Pretorius. Both of the procedures went well and they are recovering nicely. The collection of the love offering this morning is for service of compassion. You can make use of the QR codes on your chairs, uh, but the deacons will also be coming around with the collection bags. Then Brother Tiens de Bruyne will be ordained as elder during the evening service. And uh, we are also inviting everybody to join the Cachet prayer meeting on Tuesday evenings. Uh, anybody who's interested can conta contact Janku Westhuizen, whose contact details is in the Cachet billet. And then we welcome Yandrei Kutsia, who will be preaching us for us this morning from the Lord's Word. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This will be my first time in English, so a disclaimer. Listen to the message and not the grammar. We start our service with the words of Daniel 6, when King Darius talks to David and make a proclamation about the God we all worship. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one who shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Let us pray together for, for the blessing. Peace be to you and love with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be, all, be with all of those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. We now respond by, by singing together Psalm 85 verse 4, Psalm 85 verse 4, so after we will confess our faith. confess our faith at his, as it's written in the Apostles' Creed, you can say with me in your heart, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy 
Catholic Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may sit. We will be reading from the law as it's written, Exodus 20. Exodus 20. I, believe I will be reading from the English Standard Version. You're most welcome to follow me in any other translation. <clears throat> it read as follows. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the la house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above, or that's in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of your Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. To keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. We respond by singing now Psalm 23, verse 1, very known psalm. We will sing, and then thereafter we will pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, who is among us and who reign from the heavens, thank you again that we may meet as children of your children, being here together to worship your name. And we thank you for every chance we can get to worship your name, because it is magnificent. We do ask that you will make us humble, keep us calm, and let us hear. May your word speak loudly into our hearts that there may be change and life where they were before death. This we ask in your humble servant, but this we ask also in the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we read out of Scripture, 
we will we will sing Psalm 91, the first three verses. Thereafter, we will read from Hebrews. from the letter from Hebrews, the whole of the first chapter. Once again, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, but you're most welcome to follow me in any other translation. Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be him a father, or shall he be to me a son? And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels wings, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of a son, he says, Your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with oil of gladness beyond your companions. And 
You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? we we'll read to there. In our culture today, people frequently ask, does God still speak? And if He speaks, how do I know it's Him? How can I know it's God speaking to me? We usually find these questions among many profound Christians. Usually when they have to make big life decisions or when they are utterly without hope. And it's easy for us today to feel that God has gone silent. That if God has ever spoken, He surely has stopped. He surely has stopped communicating with us. Maybe you have felt like this before. Praying to God, but not receiving an answer. Maybe you have to make difficult decisions in the coming months. And you need God to speak. You need Him to communicate and to hear the path you should take. But no matter the reason why you want God to speak, it always boils down to a heartfelt longing that we want God to speak to us. We need His voice. And we want it. But usually we have this elaborate picture about how God should speak to us. Something of a dramatic experience. We read in scripture of the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses through the burning bush and saying, Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. And our reaction is sometimes, this is God Almighty. He has spoken here. Similar, we read in the book of Acts, God shining forth from out the heavens on to, onto Paul on his way to Damascus, speaking loudly. And then we want to ask, but why can't God speak to me like this? Why cannot, why cannot God speak in this breathtaking way? For then I will know it's him speaking to me. And usually, if God does not speak to me in this way, or in this impressive manner, we think God has gone silent. But as we will see out of the book of Hebrews, God has been speaking to man for a very long time, and is still audible today. In the sermon, we will look at basic two, bas two basic points. One, God's revelation is through His Son, and to how we should respond to this revelation, God's revelation through His Son, and how we should respond to this revelation. Our first point. If you have any knowledge about the book of Hebrews, you will know we don't know very much about the book. We don't know who wrote it or when it was written. What we do know is that the book of Hebrews is addressed to Christians enduring much suffering. Second generation Christians, to be exact. Which means that the listeners of this book would be fairly familiar with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And further, we know from chapter 13 that these Christians were experiencing hardship beyond a certain level of comfort. Chapter 13, we read that many of them were humiliated in public. And that because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Some of them were thrown into prison. And some lost their possess possessions for them to survive. The result of many of them was to get rid of their faith. Because their faith wa was beginning to cost them more than they were willing to give. They became relaxed in their faith and lost their grip on the preciousness of the gospel. The writer of Hebrews writes it in chapter 5 saying... Actually, that at this stage, this listener should have been developed into ministers. People proclaiming the gospel, ministering to, to each other. But yet, 
They are still longing like babes for milk. They've gone in reverse. And once again, they should be reminded of the basic principles of the gospel. Tune in to what the writer is saying. He said, you heard the gospel, but still you don't know it. You have heard it once or twice or three times, as many as you can count, but still it has not touched your heart. And again and again throughout the book of Hebrews, the writer shows us the meaning and the understanding of a gospel. In the text we are focusing today, Hebrews 1, the writer begins by showing us that Jesus is above any angel. Now at first glance it may seem strange that the writer would begin by comparing Jesus with angels. Why would he do that? The reason is simple. Angels are messengers of divine. They, be, they bring divine messengers. They are representatives of God himself. Which means that angels come into continual contact of God's awesome presence. His holy presence. From the beginning of, from the beginning of creation, the angels operated by God's presence. And when an angel appears, it's a dramatic experience, not true. Think, for example, what John writes in, book, in the book of Revelation. John writes in chapter 22, that when an angel appears before him, he almost immediately falls to the ground. The reason is simple. An angel appears to bring a message from God. And therefore, when people see or experience an angel, they also experience that the angel speaks with authority because the message they deliver comes from the highest being of all of cosmos. Another example from Bible is when an angel appears to Joseph in Matthew 2. In a dream, the angel commands Joseph to stand up and take Maria and the child and flee to Egypt. See that Joseph doesn't start to wonder if if this is a real reality or questions the angel or anything like this, he immediately stands up and takes Maria and the child and flees to Egypt because he knows the message comes from God. Coming back to Hebrews 1, the writer is comparing the Son of Man with angels. And what is the writer of Hebrews trying to say? No matter what sort of angel no matter what message has ever been given, the Son of Man is greater than them all. And throughout Hebrews 1, the writer is showing us why the Son of God is better than any angel. In verse 4, the writer indicates that the Son of God is above the angels because he has inherited a name more excellent than that of any angel. And what is this most excellent name? Well, Son of God. God has never said to any of his angels before, You are my son. Only Jesus Christ is called the Son of God. And only him. This is important because you can only be called the Son of God if you are God. Therefore, there is no one to compare Jesus Christ with. He is the highest being in the universe. Specif specifically in verse 3, the Son of God is considered as the exact imprint of God's own nature. This is important. The word here used here as imprint refers to, a, to a, a marking a seal makes for a coin, which means exactly the same. We should not understand it to say that Jesus is like God. There's many people today that be, believe Jesus were a great prophet or a great narrator or a great leader. No, no. Jesus is God. He is the Son of God, exactly the nature of God. And Christ is also called the firstborn because he was the first to conquer death. He is the first to arose from death. And he ascended into heaven. This we confess to this morning. The Son of God is clothed with honor and dignity which is only worthy to give to God. 
The Son is glorified above everyone else and everything else. And therefore, logically, God instructs the angels in verse 6 to worship the Son. The great messengers of God should worship God. It makes only sense. Because Jesus is the highest being there is. He is the true king. The scepter is in his hand. Which means he has the last say in everything. He commands and everyone obeys. Matthew 28 shed more light on this. We read that all power in heaven and in earth is given to the Son. Do we realize what this means? Everything that has been happening in your life, knowingly or unknowingly, is under the management of Christ. Maybe the angels can see what happens around them, but the Son of God is the one who instructs them. He commands them all. And the Son of God is the Word, not true? Because through the, through the Son, the Father made everything we see, but also everything we can't see, the unseen. By implication, it means that the angels is made through the Son. Their whole existence is dependent upon God. Upon the Son of God. But in contrast, there is no end to the existence of a Son. The writer writes in um, verse 10 to 12 about um, quoting, quoting Psalm 102. And with this he is showing that the Son never changes. He's unchangeable. The Son doesn't change because he's immortal. He doesn't swift. He doesn't change. He has always been God before creation, and he will be God even though it all that he will be God even if all creation would vaporize. And then we get this striking image in verse 12, where we read that the Son of God rolls up creation as if it's as if its clothes being packed away. Think of that. The whole universe being packed away like a t-shirt. That's what the writer is saying. This means that the Son of God is the one who will bring an end to all. And when will he do that? When he comes to judge humankind. And this brings us to our second point. How should we respond to this great revelation? Words of Hebrew 1 sounds like a sermon, wouldn't you say? Well, it is because it is a sermon. It's one lengthy sermon. The whole of Hebrews is one sermon from front to back. All 13 chapters. And luckily for us, we are looking only at chapter 1. But throughout this sermon, the preacher is showing us that Jesus Christ is the better and best high priest. Better that we could ever hope for. Always pointing to Christ. And maybe when you listen to all these words, you want, to, you want to know what to do with all this information. What, what, what should you do? See, for most of us, we are familiar with the gospel. If you attend services regularly, you would have heard the gospel Sunday after Sunday, or hopefully so. But there's a danger to our hearts. We get used to habits. And this is, this is what God is showing to us this morning. You could have heard the message of Jesus Christ so many times that you have become deaf to it. And different from the first readers of Hebrews, suffering is not always needed to achieve this effect. It can be fine and go great with us, but slowly but surely our faith can subside or even fade away. And no matter what circumstances you are, the danger is always there that you get used to the gospel. And when we start to think that, we think that God does not speak anymore. When we think that the gospel is old news, know it, move on, then we start to experience that God is not speaking to us anymore. Because it's obvious, if you treat the Bible like an ancient book, you won't 
think that God will still communicate with modern man. And slowly but surely our enthusiasm will fade away. But we should remember, there was a time that God did not speak to Israel. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. And after 400 years passed away, then John the Baptist began to, to preach. In other words, there were 400 years that God did not speak to Israel. And when he spoke, he spoke through his son. Then God's word broke through the heavens. And do we find God's word among the people? John 1. It's the truth that Hebrews 1 starts with, with the following words. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In the past, God spoke in different ways. Sometimes through vision or dreams. Sometimes even using natural phenomena like the, column, the cloud column in the desert. Other times he used angels or prophets to communicate. But in this last age, this age, God speaks directly to us through his son. And this is what it means. Every word that came from God in the past finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In the Son, every prophecy, every sign, every dream, every vision finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Because every pro prophecy is partial in itself. Pointing to the one who would come to give it its fuller meaning. But we should not think that when Jesus Christ came, he just brought another message. Because what was the message Jesus Christ came to give? What was the, the message the whole of the Old Testament anticipated for? The message was himself. He was the message. The Son of God was the message anticipated for. And through the centuries, the angels brought different messages from God to human beings. But when the, so the Son of God came, he said, I am the Word. And therefore, the message of Christ differs from that of the angels, the messengers of God, because they were just words from God. But the message of Jesus Christ is to show us who God is. It's through the Son that we come to see how God loves us. It's our foundation of our gospel. But we should remember that it cost God dearly to speak to us. The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 2 that the Son of God was made less than the angels for a time. He is made less when he became human, when he came to dwell among humankind. He was made less than the messengers of God themselves for us. And when he came to earth, he came so that we could hear God speak. And in the end, he pays for his life, not true? He's the final revelation of God, but the people did not comprehend his message. And therefore, they reject him at the cross. The angels could not bring this message. It's not, it's not from the, for them possible. They were not capable of bearing this great burden. But the Son of God was. Because He's God. And as awesome as angels can be, they can't compete with this revelation of Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, we read that Jesus Christ cried out with a big voice. Immediately the temple torn from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks broke, and the death came to life. And seeing all of this, the centurion replied, Truly, he was the Son of God. Does your own heart respond like this centurion? Because no appearance of an angel, no manifestation of an angel above can compare to what we read about Jesus Christ in the Bible. 
Never. Do we see it? Christ showed us how far God was willing to heal us of our deafness. Christ cried out to the heavens, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He does not receive an answer. So that when we call out to God today, we could surely know that God will hear us. God was deaf for his cries, but he's not deaf to us. But this is not where it stops. We usually think that the crucifixion is the end. No, no, no. Because Christ rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he went to sit at the right hand of the Father. This does not mean that, the, that Christ is made a little higher than the angels. He is given the highest place in the universe because he is king. He reigns over it all. Do you hear what God is saying through his son? Because no other message can melt our hearts like the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to the degree we understand the gospel, to that degree we begin to hear and understand God's message to us. God speaks to every man and woman on earth, but not all can hear and understand him. We think that because we don't hear God, God has gone silent. No, no, no. The problem lies with us. We are the deaf ones. We are the blind ones. Sin has made us deaf to God. And the only way we can hear Him again is if the Holy Spirit rejuvenates us, works in us, changes us. Because the Spirit breaks open the message of Christ for us. To understand this thing practically, God speaks through His Bible, not true. But God does not stop speaking when we close the Bible. Why? Because the Holy Spirit reminds us of its words, continually engraving it into our hearts. The Spirit reminds us of what Christ has done and how to apply that message to our everyday lives. So vast is the message that we can understand it bit for bit. And this means that if we don't drink up the Bible every day, every second, we will probably not hear God that clearly. It's amazing how many random facts and knowledge students have about the world we live in. It's like we took the game 30 seconds to a next level. If you ask people about the celebrity, they will ans answer immediately. If you ask them about technology, they will annoyingly respond, it's common sense. Even some can show you the constellations in the sky. But when we start to, sp to speak about the Bible, you just see a cluelessness on their faces. As if it's an ancient book have never been heard of. We have to remember that you can, you can know the Bible from front to back, but that does not guarantee you to hear God's voice. You have to look at every different passage through the lens of a gospel. Unfortunately, because of time, we can't go into depth but how to read scripture correctly. But it essentially means this, that the gospel should be your lens through which you read the Bible. Not reading into the text the gospel, but leading, letting the text redirect you to the gospel. Every time, in every exact manner. But, because then the God, God's word will not enter only your mind, but also your heart change you. And it's important because many Jews today have exact same Old Testament as we do have, but we see no change. Do they hear the word of God? Because in it all we need the message of Christ desperately. It's the way we should read the Bible that it enters our hearts. It's through, the mess through this message, this great magnitude of a message, that the Spirit lets us remember that God is speaking to us, even now. God chose to speak through His Son. Let's not make it cheap by seeking for another revelation in vain. No angel can compete with this message. The message that Christ came to bring us. And this message 
is applicable to every second of our lives, to our whole being. Because through the gospel, the Spirit lets us hear that God is still speaking to every one of us. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, King above all kings, you have made your way known through your revelation of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's because of Him that we are here. It's because of Him that we have hope in our lives. Otherwise, we would be doing many other things today. But you have called us. And it gives us great pleasure that you speak to us through your Son. We, may we never think of a Bible less than we should. Always marveling at, at its wonder because it's you speaking to us. Gra engrave it into our hearts, Lord. That it may change our ways. This we ask humbly, O Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's now time for collection offerings or love offerings. Thereafter, we will sing together Psalm 150. We will now stand and sing Psalm 150, the first three verses. I'd just like to read the first words of the first verse. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord in his house with one accord. Praise him in the wide extent of his spacious firmament. Let's sing this with great hearts.
us pray together when we go out into this world to do our mission among many people. Grace be to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. Amen.